Okay, I think I'm ready. So, hello everyone. I've heard that I should start a presentation with a joke. So, today I'll be your coach and I will learn you that, that whatever you will do, you should always give 100% unless you're donating blood. <laughs> so, my name is Jacob. I run my own blog, uh, so I, I, I would be happy if you, go, if you would go there. You can also find me on Twitter and on GitHub. And as you have might already noticed, I work for El Passion. And today's talk uh, will be actually a retro of one of our recent projects we did. Uh, it, it lasted for like nine months, during which we have written like 200,000 lines of code uh, of iOS, Swift code only with 5,000 files, and what's important to note in here that we have like almost 7,000 test cases. So as you might get, have guessed, this talk will be mostly about unit testing and test-driven development. So during the talk, I will, uh, I will intr introduce you to, to the topic. I will show you how to build a code the way that it's testable, uh, and I will present how to overcome a common obstacles when testing the code, which are controllers, views, global methods. I will show you how to refactor your test code so that it can be easily uh, read by human. And also I will briefly mention test code generation and methods. So, a unit test. A unit test is an automated piece of code that invokes a unit of work, not a class, not a method, it's a unit of work, and it verifies a single assumption about the behavior of that unit of work. A good test should be automated, should run fast, and it should uh, test, of course, a single concept in the system. But what's most, most important from the points on the list is that it's trustworthy. So every time it fails, uh, you should know that you have screwed something up in the code, and it's not a problem with the test itself. And TDD uh, is like a holy grail of iOS development. So everyone has heard of that. Nobody is using that, or at least it's not a common practice. It's a programming technique in, in which first you write a piece of test, and then you write just enough production code to make this test pass. And when I'm talking with uh, other developers about TDD, uh, th that's a typical response. We don't do the test because uh, we are not allowed to, we don't have enough time, and it didn't work for us. The third point is the most important, because at least somebody has tried that, and it didn't work. And that presentation will show you what to do to make it work. And for the, for the first two, I have a good story to share. I used to work in a company which were a subcontractor for a marketing agency. And one day, a guy from this marketing agency comes to us and asks, asks us to rewrite an existing app for their client. And he says, just do whatever you can to make the estimation as big as it's possible, because we want to earn some money. Just use the best practices and so on and so on. So what happens? We provide them the est estimation. Three months later, I come back to the team. The, the client, of course, agrees. Three months later, I came back to the team and I asked, hey guys, do you do TDD? And what's the response? No, we don't have time for do, to do that. So sorry, if it's not the best possible scenario, then, then what, what comes next? You should try it now. So TDD, is, uh, TDD workflow is commonly known. You've got three phases. First of them is red, when you've got a failing test. Second one is green. You, you write a production code, make the test pass, and then you refactor the code. But what's not commonly known is how to really make the red phase work. And to illustrate that, you need to know three laws of TDD, which are, you can't write any production code until you write a failing unit test. You can't write more of a unit test than it is sufficient to fail, and not compiling is failing specifically. And third one, you can't write more production code than is sufficient to pass currently failing test. And how it works in practice. I have, I have a short demo for you. Just hope it will work, actually. OK, so can you see the code? It's not too sophisticated, I guess. Uh, it's 
it's just a simple view controller that has a label inside uh, and I have already sketched some tests in there and what I want to do I have I want to have a property uh, with a name inside and I want to pass there a name of the person and I want to see uh, this person greeted in this label so first first of all I want to have a property in name so I go to the production code I try to write a property in there and I'm already doing it wrong because I cannot write any production code without actually having a test case first so I'm back to the test target and I try to test that Jacob is greeted and in here I set the property that doesn't exist yet with a name and I'm trying to write an assertion of what what's going to happen and this assertion I'm doing it wrong because there is a second law of TDD which says you cannot write any more tests then it's sufficient to make it fail and this one doesn't even compile so it so it's already failing I need to revert to the view controller and add a property in there this will compile so I can try to assert now so we have a label and we have a text in there and I wanted to say hello Jacob okay so this I, I can run it uh, this run will obviously fail because nothing is happening upon setting the property and now I I'll try to implement that so when the property is set I try to mo I, I try to set the name in here which says hello and name and this one is wrong too because I'm trying to write a code it's not a minimal code for this test to pass the minimal one doesn't even take this property into account so I just hard code a string the test will pass because this is this is what I want to do but that's not how I want this to work I want to, to actually have the name printed in there so I need to write another function with another name no, this time I want okay this compiles so I can proceed on writing the test yep. so we have another test in here it should fail okay it has failed so now I need to implement that the property is optional so I need to unwrap it okay and I need to pass it right now here okay so now I have a green test and I have finished what I wanted to build but there is, there is also a third step which is refactoring so I would like to get rid of this if let there because I don't like to have the conditional statements in the code so I take the name property and I map over that and if it's present I will assign a correct text in there will it work yeah, so I haven't screwed anything up I have refactored that the code still works okay so now back to the presentation oh I have closed it unfortunately okay okay so uh, we know what TDD is and how to write a test in a test driven manner now we want to know what to write so that it's testable and it turns out that writing testable code is actually pretty simple you need to create functions that take values as input and return values because the functions will ideally have no side effects and you can test everything like that but it's easier said than done obviously and there is a really really great talk that I would like to recommend to everyone it's called boundaries and it's like a bible of test driven development or unix testing in general uh, it's a talk by Gary Bernhardt about Ruby but it's not doesn't really matter you will understand that and it shows how to use a simple values for uh, communicating between different objects instead of invoking side effects 
and because side effects are really hard to test, so what, what's proposed in there is to split your code into two parts. And one of them is imperative shell, which actually does all we need to do in real life, which is uh, call the API, have side effects, uh, real world de dependencies, and all the stateful operations. Another part of the code is a functional core that contains only purely functional transformation, which there are no side effects. But what is really important in here is that all the decisions, which means all the if statements, all the guard statements are in the functional core. So all the code that actually decides what we should do next is easily testable because it's functional. And to do that presentation, I was looking for, for a pretty good, uh, like, for, for, a, for a good uh, illustration of that. Uh, and I, I was going through all the, all the stuff I could find on the internet and everything, all of the, uh, all of the examples I found were pretty, I would say, long and not, not, really, uh, not, not, not really appropriate to show on a quick presentation. But unfortunately, I have, I have opened my own code and I found one pretty good example of violating it. And this code is pretty long, so don't try to understand it. Just try to focus on what I'm, I will say. We've got a really simple scroll view and the code in here will make it snap to pages. So whenever, okay, whenever I'll scroll that, it will stop at the, at the given page. And if I try to scroll in between, it will just revert to, to the other page. And it's implemented uh, by conforming to UI scroll view delegate. And you have this method. The only thing that you need to know is that it takes a pointer as a parameter. And the initial value of that pointer is where the scroll view will stop. <coughs> If you modify that pointer, you can modify the point that scroll view stops. And other than I'm modifying it by using an extension on a scroll view with a lot, of, a lot of maths in there that you don't really need to understand. But what's important from there is that I'm using some of the state from the scroll view, which is frame size and content size, and that there are decisions in this code. So there are guard statements and there is an if statement in here that I want to test. Uh, and what's wrong with that code is that it, it becomes immediately obvious when you try to test that, because the test case looks like that. I need to take a scroll view in here. Uh, I need to set up the frame correctly, because I rely on that. I need to set content size, and I need to maintain the target content offset. Then, in every test case, I need to set the initial value of that, convert this point to a pointer, because this is what actually the delegate requires from me. I need to pass it to the delegate method, and then I can assert the mutation of the state. So what I'm doing here is that I do side effects because I mutate this target content offset pointer, and I, I have decisions because I calculate the offset where the scroll view should stop. And what can we do about that? Let's try to convert it to a functional core. So I have all of, the, all of this code extracted to another dependency. It's no longer an extension on UI scroll view. And I have a structure that replaces the state of UI scroll view. So I take, the, uh, I take the content size in here and I take the frame in here. So I don't rely on a hidden state. I take all of the arguments as an input in here and just return a simple value from there. And the code is basically the same I had previously. If we, if we look at the test for that, then we can see how easy it is to test it, test this. Because I prepare the content info, I just inject that with the values I want to test, and I assert the outputs. And if we look closer, um, you can see that the tests that were written in here, so those three test cases, which are pretty cumbersome to test up, to, to set up, are replaced by, by this single test case in, in, in this functional core. But now I need to hook this up to delegate because, uh, and I need to test that too. So what I do, I need this calculator I have created and tested. 
I need the content info. That's total pages. I take the values from, from scroll view that were previously hidden by the state. Uh, so this is prime width. And what I do in here is just, I invoke this calculator. I pass the offset, like the initial one. Uh, and I pass the other properties in here. Okay, and if everything's right, then this should still pass. So what happened is that I replaced all the calculations that were mutating the state with just a functional transformation. And if I wanted to test right now whether I have hooked this method correctly, I don't even have to stop anything. Because why? I, I, have, the, I have that dependency that is deterministic, gives the same result. I don't even need to inject that. I can just use it, use it in the code as usual. I can have it hard-coded. And still, I will be able to delete most of the tests from there. Because what interests me now, calculations are already tested. So I only need to make sure that I have hooked this up correctly. But most of the test cases can just vanish from there. And I, if I have other, uh, other cases that I need to test, then I can add them just to this functional core. It's way, way easier to read, way easier to write, and way easier to maintain. And this is what actually sticking to boundaries will, uh, will give you. Okay, so now let's try to go back to the presentation. Okay, another. Okay. Okay, so the boundaries is like a topic on, a, on its own. I could stand in here and give you a big talk on that, but it's, it's not what I meant to do. Uh, so if you are really interested into that, there are, a couple of, there are a couple of resources, great resources that you can learn from. And or also there is an article on my blog that shows the same example I have shown during, uh, during, during the presentation, but this time with, with more explanation. So uh, I, I, would, I would really uh, recommend the first one to watch. It's, it's like a must-have for, for every developer. Okay, so the controllers, massive controllers. It's an obstacle in testing. I think we all know that, but to be sure, just try to find the largest files in our project. And what we will see, it's like we have eight largest files and six of them are controllers. And please guess, what should be the numbers in here? Like, what, what are the numbers, uh, the, the, the longest controller? How long should it be? Just give me a wild guess. Thousand, hundred, okay. So it's not that great, but our longest controller in our code base is like 140 lines, which is pretty okay, I believe. And it should stay that way. The, uh, the shorter the files, the, they are easier to maintain. But how can you do that? Let's see what's the average controller size to find out. And if we run this on our code base, it, you, you, will sh you will see that we have like 38 screens in app that you can navigate to, but we have 164 controllers in the app, which means that per every screen, we have on average 4.3 controllers. And it gives us like 1,200 lines in total, uh, 12,000 lines of totals in total for all the controllers. And the average controller is 75 lines long. And to achieve that, you need to add more view controllers, as you, have, as you have seen. And how to do that? Never subclass or do it as a last resort. You don't, you don't even need a full uh, capability of, of, of the subclass controller, mostly. Use child controllers for composition. And use the protocols the same way you would do for other, de other dependency injection um, powered code. So for the boundaries. And refer to the controllers by using the composite type. So you use the type, you know that the controller is UI view controller. That conforms to the protocol that you have defined. And in practice, 
First, you need to know how to add a child view controller. You can do that by this sim simple function. It's an extension on the controller. Uh, you invoke it, add method. You add a sub view and make it as, uh, as big as the parent. And finally, you need to call this did move method, passing the parent controller. It's the standard way recommended by Apple in the DEX. Then you introduce a child controller. And as I said, you need to extract the protocol. Uh, in this case, we only want to know that the, the, the child controller uh, provides a functionality of selecting a product. So if product, a user selects a product, uh, it will call back to this method uh, passing, passing the name in there. We implement the child controller. So we initialize it with its own dependencies. Uh, we have like our long implementation in there. It can do whatever you want. And we have this property uh, from, from the from the protocol. Then, uh, in a parent, you just get a complex type, which is UIV controller and the protocol name, and you inject a factory into that that uh, can create a controller of such a type. You embed that controller, which is created from from this factory lazily. And the be beautiful thing about that is when you want to test that you just create a stub of the controller, which looks exactly like that. So it has totally no implementation. It has only the callbacks defined by the protocol. And to test the parent, you just instantiate the stub, and it, you just return this stub every time from the factory. And you want, if you want to test the boundaries, then you just invoke a callback passing the product name on, on the child controller. And you can verify that the label that is on parent controller has correct value after that interaction. So we have get ridden of all of, the, all of the implementation from the child controller. And there are a lot of examples of child controllers that we don't normally use. For example, a single button. It's a perfectly good chi child view controller because it performs side effects. Most of the time it has error handling. You need to disable that during the, during the, for example, outbound traffic to your API. Uh, the forms are a pretty good example too, because you need to validate user input, you need to present the input in a complex, complex way, you need to handle the errors. And there is also a trick with API data coordination. When you have like one parent controller, it calls the API and fetches the data. And once it has a data, it presents one of three immutable children types. With one, one of them can present the data if it's actually present. You can have an empty state controller if there is no data, and you can have an error controller. But all of these children are immutable, so they don't change while the program is executed. They are just embedded once we have the data. Okay, so we had view controllers in there, and view controllers are, uh, we also need views to, to build them. And it's, of course, impossible to, to build a view for programmatically uh, without running, uh, running an app. Or is it? Actually, it turns out that you can actually kind of TDD views too, even if you build them from, uh, from code. And first thing uh, to do that, you need to have snapshot uh, tests defined. And what is a snapshot test? A snapshot test uh, is a view test that takes your view, in a state that it's correct, it renders that view to an image and stores that image into repository alongside with the test. And now, every time the test is run in the future, the view that in the current state is rendered and both of the images, the one which is rendered right now and the one that is stored with the repository, are compared against each other. The, effect of, the outcome of that is that you have it, 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 you have an, let's say, expected view in there. This is one is stored in the repository. We have made some changes, so this is how the actual view looks like. So we have replaced the red color with, uh, with the green one and the thumbs down with thumbs up. And if, if you run such a test case, it will print out all of the three images. And this one is important. It's a diff that shows you what have changed. So you can clearly see what's what's wrong uh, what's wrong with your view but 
how, how can you use that together with, let's say, TDD-like flow? So first we have red face. So we, we have some kind of a design. We need to take a size of that design so, so that we know what we are building, actually. Then we create a test. And this test just has a view in it, just like, like a usual, usual one. Uh, you assign a frame to that. And what's, what's pretty strange about that is that you implement this view as a part of the test. Uh, what's really important is that you set a record mo mode flag set to true, which in a snapshot test case means that uh, the test will always fail, but it will always, uh, it will always render the reference image and store it on the disk. And you iterate through that. So you change the code of the view, you run the tests, you, 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 you check out the reference image that is recorded in, n next to the tests. And if the work is not finished, you repeat the cycle until you have finished building a review. And this is when the red face finishes. Now we have a green face, which is just flipping the record mode flag to false. And from now on, every time we run the test, they, they will be implemented with our ideal snapshot that is stored in the repository. And then in the refactor phase, we move the view to a production target and we refactor the view like we want. And when during the refactoring, we know that we haven't screwed anything up because it will show up in the test case. So this is how you would test views. And now another common obstacle, which is global methods. And uh, one of the examples might be when you need to draw something. All you need to know about that code is that it, 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 it outputs an image in a single color. What's important is that part. So that, this is the, like a wrapper on a context that takes a closure in and performs all the drawing. And you might wonder why the wrapper, because this code, uh, if, if you wouldn't use it, it looks exactly like that. So it's polluted with all of the UI kit uh, UI kit functions that are global that uh, doesn't don't belong to any module, and their name are the, their names are so long that I couldn't even fit them into slides to to render correctly. But this code is also a part of our code base, so we should test that. And how to do that? To to test this code without modifying it, uh, we cannot stop it if we don't want to modify this code. But to test it, we can use another trick. And to know that, we need to know how Swift namespace resolution works. So if I were to decide that I screw Apple and I want to provide my own view controller, because I don't like what they have given to me, I can write a class in my own module, name it UI view controller, give it some random methods, and I can create that controller into, in, in my own module. I can call the methods and everything will work because it's my own code in my own module. And even if I import UIKit, the Swift will prefer that. But if I wanted to screw Apple even harder and provide my own controller pod, then this would not compile because the same name is imported from two frameworks and the Swift doesn't know which one to choose. It's not my own module. So I would have to prefix it with the module name in here. And how can you use that trick to test global methods? You can define your own global method, which is, has exactly the same signature as the one from UIKit. And you create a global property that stores a pointer to a method that's actually called when this one is invoked. So in here, we just take what UIKit gives us. This strange trick uh, results and is that we don't have to modify this code at all. So if we were to delete those, those global functions from our project and those global, global variables, then nothing would happen because the code would no compile as normally. But when we have the tests, we can now override the global property with wherever we want. So we can return a constant image from that and th this is actually the property or a pointer that's going to be invoked every time the test is running. So if, if we invoke the code that relies on those global methods, then this is what's actually going to be returned. And this is what we want in our tests. And now we just can draw this image without 
even a drawing code, and we can assert that what's returned is actually what's returned in here from uh, exactly what's returned in here from, from the stubbed variable. And it's pretty pretty neat trick to, to, to use. Refactoring test code. So test code is also a part of your code base and you should refactor that. And this is what we often overlook when we develop because we don't care about that code that much. Imagine that you have a simple model. It's a user. It has its own ID and his, uh, the user has its own birth date. Uh, it's called born and it's, it's, it's a wrong name but it's only for the sake of clarity on the slides. And I want to have a functionality that I want to greet every user born in January a price. So I have my own system under test. It has winners method. It takes array of users and it returns IDs of people that I want to greet. But the setup of the code looks like that. So we have all those hard-coded dates in there and so on. And if anything fails, how can you possibly fix that? You, you, you would have to decode those timestamps. It's, timestamp, it's really, really bad. But what you can do instead? You can write extensions on a user and create a test data. And this test data can be named wherever you want. So you can give human readable names to that. And in here, we have users that are named. And one of them is born January 1990. So everyone knows what that means. And you don't have to deal with timestamps. And you don't have to deal with timestamps twice, because you can have an extension that actually creates dates from human readable format instead of the timestamp. Uh, or you should have them in test so that everyone can read that. But having those test data defined, if we were to refactor this test case, it, it looks like that. So it takes an array of those users and I immediately know which ones should be taken into account. And I can even replace those IDs with calls to user that born January 1990 that ID. And this one is immediately clear to everyone who reads that. It's a really simple trick, but it really, really makes the test code simpler and easier to maintain. You can refactor the test code. You can also generate that. Uh, and if you want to generate a code in Swift, you have like one single go to point, which is sorcery. It's a tool that takes a template uh, in a stencil language that knows about all of the classes and all of the types defined in your code base. And it outputs, uh, outputs the, the code that you can generate from this template. And we have a really peculiar use case for that because as, as, as you might know, there is an important metric in test-driven development, which is code coverage, that leads you to the points in the code where, which are not tested, that you should really handle with, uh, with care or, or just test it. And if you write the code for the controllers and for views, you have those everywhere. Those will never be called. They have zero code coverage. So your controllers are not tested. Your views are not tested. And every, every time you introduce a new feature, you go back, to, uh, you go back in there just to see that it's this method that was not tested. Thanks, Apple. And I really hated that because I, I really used, used this untested code, uh, code metric at, at all. So I have written a simple template. And all it does, it, it creates an array of factory methods that take a coder and return a view. You can do the same for controllers and so on. And this template iterates uh, iterates over all the views in, in your code base. And if the view defines the init with coder method, it appends it to an array. It's not clear in here, but it's clear in here. So this is the output of that. So it creates an array of all initializers in your project that, that are view initializers. So what can you do now? You can write a single test that goes through all of these initializers, invokes that with any coder, and asserts that it returns new. So the code coverage is up. The test is actually meaningful because uh, this is what you want to do, really. 
and you don't need to bother about that uh, never in the future. I think that's really great. And Sorcery has a lot of other options too. You can create an equitable, equitable conformance. This one you can do in Swift natively, but the difference is that Sorcery allows you to uh, specify this conformation, conformance in extension which is really useful when you want to have a model that's not equitable by default, but you only need this equality in tests. So then it's, it's better to use sorcery, and we use that uh, over, over the equitable that, that is Swift generated. You can generate mock objects uh, using sorcery, and you can even define your own complex assertions. And we, we have a couple of that. One, for example, this one is interesting. We have an enum called root, it describes every navigable route in our application. And we have an architecture which requires us to have a single factory class for every route. And if, if it's not the case, the app will crash and we don't want that. So with, with, the, with the sorcery, we can actually assert that this one is, is really, really true. So that there is, exists a factory for every route in our code. Also, we have integration tests in our target that hit, hit the real API. It's, of course, not in the unit testing bundle, but in the other bundle. And with Sorcery, we have, a, we have a template defined that we test that every request in the app that is defined has its own integration test. And you can do this with code generation. Finally, metrics. And metrics are pretty important when you, when you want to develop a pretty good code. Uh, we measure a lot of metrics on every pull request and we measure project size. Uh, it's pretty informative, uh, especially average file size. It shouldn't ever grow too big. We, of course, use SwiftLint, but there is one, uh, one peculiar tool in there that's not so widely known. It's for co copy-paste detection. I will show that later. And we also measure code coverage. The metrics are great, but you need to visualize them somehow. And you can do that using Danger. Danger is a script that hooks to your CI pipeline, and after the build is finished, it can run arbitrary linting on your pull request. It sounds complicated, but it's really simple in practice. So what Danger does, it, does, it spits out this, this comment on every pull request with your own defined rules. So if, if there is a VIP in the title, it says it's, it's work in progress. It can warn you that if, the, if there's a lot of changes that it's a big PR, you can hook, in, hook up SwiftLint to that. So you can see all the SwiftLint issues that are found in the code. And you can also hook up the JSCPD in there, which is, as I said, a tool that detects the copy-paste design pattern. This is my favorite. And if you hook that up with Danger, it will look like that. So every time a pull request is sent, what will happen is that if you have any duplication in the code, uh, it will print out the names of the two files that are duplicated and the exact lines of duplication. And this tool is pretty good because you can configure it uh, to, to, do, to a huge extent so you can adjust those rules to your code base so that there are no false positives in your case. And to have that integration, it's pretty simple. You need a configuration file for that JSCPD tool. Uh, what's important in there is that it needs to output the results to a file in JSON format. And then in Danger, you just create a script face that loads this file, runs this tool, loads this file, and it spits out wherever issues are found in there. And there is a full version of that because this one doesn't handle errors and doesn't print a table. If you want that, then you can go in there. Uh, it's also available in the slides. The link will, will be provided by after the talk. And the last metric is, of course, code coverage. And it's sometimes uh, mistakenly took as a, as, a, as a metric that says how good your tests are. So you can have like 100% code coverage, but not ha have a single assertion. So it will never fail. And it, it's not a good metric to do that. As I said, you only should use that to detect the parts of the code that are not unit tested yet. And you should also visualize that, especially if you're heavy on unit testing or if you're doing test-driven development. 
Uh, there is a plugin for that. It hooks up Danger with the Xcode, the built-in tool for, uh, for Xcode's code coverage files. And now the, let's say, mysterious title of the presentation is unveiled, because this is the screenshot from, uh, from our actual project, the one that I have mentioned. And the, the, this one is actually to prove you that even if you have a deadline and you have pretty big, uh, we had a hard deadline because it was actually powered by European Union documents, so, so, so you need to be completed in time. Even if you have a deadline, even if you, if you need to deliver fast, you can still do unit testing in TDD to, to a huge extent, like we did, and we have successfully do that. So this one should motivate you to at least, at least have some test. And you might wonder what, why it's not 100%. Actually, if you would, like, if you would uh, run the code through the debugger, you would see that 100% code is covered. It's just a bug of the Swift code coverage tool. So, this, is, this shows how Apple uses that and how often they, they, they need that tool. And having said that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope that you have liked that. If you want to really dig deeper into that, uh, first you can download the slides from, from there. Then there is a great blog about test-driven development on iOS, and it's my favorite by John Reed. I, I, I can really recommend that. And third, third resource I would really recommend is the GIST I have mentioned. It's, uh, it, it's a, a document that has a lot of reference to the boundaries or functional share, uh, functional share uh, sorry, imperative shell functional core design pattern. And you can find a lot of articles on that in that GIST. And last but not least, I would like to get some feedback, so please, if you, if, you, if you have a Twitter account, please write whatever in there. You can say that the presentation sucks. Uh, I just want to make sure that my employee knows that I'm not on Canary Islands right now and I'm really doing this presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Yep. Okay, so we, we have like 7,000 tests and on ours, we, we run all of them on our CI. Uh, it takes like 10 minutes to, 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 to execute the code. We have the CI in-house because we are using a lot of third-party de dependencies that we don't really want to set up on, on a hosted environment. Uh, but still, it's pretty fast and this is by the definition of unit test. It's if, if there is a one that's really really slow, you, you should make it faster by, uh, by just uh, stubbing the, the slow dependencies and trying to eliminate all of that. So we, we run all of them. We run integration tests periodically. So those, those are the slow ones. We, we, we don't set up them, like we, we don't uh, invoke them on every commit. So they are invoked uh, at, at, at different rates. What but about yeah, we, we are using device agnostic snapshots. This, 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 one, uh, this one is uh, actually iPhone project only, so it's kind of easier. Uh, and we have them alongside our real unit tests. Uh, but the, the trick is that for, for the development to be faster, because waiting for like a minute to execute 7,000 tests is pretty cumbersome, we have the app split in frameworks. So we, we only try to, we, we try to circumvent that by, by having those frameworks. So CI runs all the tests and we run locally only, only the, the test for the modified framework. Yep. I have a question concerning the um, controller that you've shown. Yep. Uh, you mentioned that you're using a view controller for a button. Yep. And Uh, yeah, it is. And it is it, so you are using really the view controller container, right? For the yeah, version. yeah. So what was the rationale behind using the view controller container and not, for example, 
you model also some other structures like outside of the UI system? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's just a let's say a matter of preference, uh, like my own, because I, I really, I, despite we are using Eric Swift, I really hate the view model like architecture, and in 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 that sense, that view model performs any operations because this really isn't the model for me, and I, I really prefer the old style for that. But yeah, of course, you could use other 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 con containers for that. It's just a choice that we, we have made to, to, to stick with the controller part. It's, uh, it's purely, you know, by, by the likes of our own, not, not like uh, decided by any, any other factor. Plus you can reuse controllers between frameworks easily. You don't have to have the same architecture for, for every framework. That, that's a plus. Are there any other questions? I don't see any, so thank you once again.